Okay, sounds good. Welcome everyone to another session of School for Course in Miracles. Uh, my name is Bruce Rawls, and tonight we're going to talk about can God be reached directly. So first of all, first first of all, I, I thought I'd start with the indirect stuff, <laughs> since I think the course actually emphasizes a lot of the indirect stuff. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, and um, I thought it all would be good. It, it seems like it, no matter what we're talking about, today's workbook lesson always applies. <laughs> so um, I thought I would start with a, a little bit of lesson 94 and just read a couple of paragraphs and uh, use that as opening meditation. So if you want, you can turn to it. It's uh, on page 164 in the workbook. And I'm just going to read the first couple of paragraphs as a meditation, because I think it, it's all interconnected and all interrelated and all holographic. And uh, why not? <laughs> so is everybody there that wants to read along? Lesson 94, today's workbook lesson. I am as God created me. So if you want, you can sit back and relax, close your eyes or whatever, and uh, I'll just read it and we can ruminate on it. <laughs> Today, we continue with the one idea which brings complete salvation, the one statement which makes all forms of temptation powerless, the one thought which renders the ego silent and entirely undone. You are as God created you. The sounds of this world are still, the sights of this world disappear, and all the thoughts that this world ever held are wiped away forever by this one idea. Here is salvation accomplished. Here is sanity restored. True light is strength, and strength is sinlessness. If you remain as God created you, you must be strong and light must be in you. He who ensured your sinlessness must be the guarantee of strength and light as well. You are as God created you. Darkness cannot obscure the glory of God's son. You stand in light, strong in the sinlessness in which you were created and in which you will remain throughout eternity. So if you want to just close your eyes for a moment or two and we'll reflect on the idea that we're as God created us. I'll bring us back. Okay. Meanwhile, back at the dream. <laughs> Anyone ponder the idea that you know, our creation really is uh, uh, a way to, you know, th thinking about how our, we were created uh, is a way to reconnect, if you will, or, or uh, be reached. Uh, by God or reach reach to God, um, and that is, that is the relationship, right? We <laughs> we we are the created, and uh, that perfect oneness is the creator. Even if we don't understand what that means at this point, um, there's a place in our mind that does. So, anyway, so one, of the, uh, one of the one of the testing one two three. How's my sound? <laughs> okay, so. In, in the, uh, one of the things that Lynn was pointing out, Corona was pointing out, um, 
is there's a lot of emphasis in this these current 10 lessons about uh, uh, this experience almost like of reaching God directly that this experience of what John Butler calls the infinite um, completion or a non dualistic experience, if you will, capital S self, and then then sort of the, how do we get there? Well, we get there through a miracle. I mean, we're moving, we're learning how to do miracles. And then part of the like waking up to strength of miracles that hit me this morning was um, in all five lessons, he's talking about God's strength versus little old me, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, through my weakness, through my weakness, like insisting on, on, on feeling guilty, insisting on feeling weak, and, and then not, um, like paragraph two says, true light equals strength, and then true strength equals sinlessness. So, I mean, there's all this, in every lesson, and at least up to this point, there's all this emphasis on um, connecting with the real strength inside of us. Meaning, am I willing to lay down, I can't do this, like, oh, this is too hard, or how long have I been doing this course and I'm still not getting real results? Like, all that, all that's like kind of proclaiming my weakness. And am I willing to lay that down even for a minute in order to experience something else? Not even go to an experience of capital S self, but just kind of that in between stage between feeling weak and guilty and hopeless <laughs> to you know, like moving up the ladder kind of thing. So yeah, that's all. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the suspension of belief in what isn't that opens the, the door to the possibility of what is, <laughs> even if we haven't walked through it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's very helpful. Yeah. So I, I was, I was looking at the, as I often do is the, the number of words in, in, uh, the section uh, 26 in the manual, Can God Be Reached Directly? Um, and uh, there's, uh, first of all, there's 4,422 instances of the word God. So <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to get away from, from God, <laughs> even if it's an incomprehensible, all-inclusive, uh, pure non-dual, <laughs> beyond our language to to you know to fathom uh yeah idea um that's a whole lot of instances you know so i think i think that's a pretty important uh, aspect of the course <laughs> needless to say and then then i look for you know, the other major words in that that title reach there's 269 instances so we're, there's a lot of reaching going on and, and depends on which thought system we're reaching with of course that determines the outcome of that and then if I, if I looked for just direct without, you know, forcing it to be uh, it, just that, uh, you know, the, directly, if, direct or variations, there's 237 instances. But if I narrow it down to just directly, there's 37 instances, which is still quite a few. But I thought I'd focus on, because the course really is kind of a not no curriculum, it's an indirect curriculum, I th thought I'd focus on the six instances of indirect that appear in the course. So if, if the course is a not no curriculum and very indirect, we don't need to say yes to spirit any more than a water molecule in the ocean needs to say yes to the ocean. <laughs> it, it already is part of the ocean. So however, we do have to drop, uh, pun intended, our molecule habit. So, so this is because the course meets us where we think we're at, a silly, seemingly separate self swimming in a sea of specialness and substitutions. Much of the practice involves seeing our misinterpretations through Holy Spirit's forgiveness and vaporizing the made, made up guilt to reveal the innocence that was there all along. So just a few, few thoughts to get us going. Um, and then, then when I started looking at the, uh, this, those six instances of, of indirect, one of them was one of my favorite paragraphs. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that one first. Um, I just made a little note here. The first paragraph of our beloved forgotten song shows the compassion the Holy Spirit has for us, needing to see that nothing happened to shatter perfect oneness. We return in awareness to the peace we never left by indirectly 
realizing that leaving was impossible and we no longer want to maintain the barriers to truth in our mind. With that inspired motivation, we undo our resistance to love by questioning every treasured grievance, annoyance, and upset from hangnails to holocausts. So we just have to kind of look at every, the whole gamut of stuff that seems to upset us and just question is that what we want to value and, uh, and just gently loosen our white knuckle grip on all those, <laughs> all those things that, that uh, really don't make us happy. So but we have to see that for ourselves. So here's the first paragraph of uh, the Forgotten Song, which is the opening uh, part of chapter 21 here. So I'll just read that. You don't have to go to it because I'm just going to read it really fairly quickly. Never forget the world the sightless see, in quotes, must be imagined for what it really looks like is unknown to them. Well, we're, we're all clueless here about what perfect oneness is. And that's okay. <laughs> but we know we're drawn to it. And it's that motivation of knowing that there's something better, there's a better way that uh, keeps us, you know, magnetically locked into Holy Spirit's tractor beam um, by repelling against what doesn't work. So the, 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 what's pulling us forward really is the, the propulsion uh, or the, the denial of the denial of truth. The, the, we're, we're being the anti-gravity force that's lifting us out of ego's uh, dungeon is is the uh, realization that it never delivers anything we want. <laughs> yeah. Any comments or questions so far? Okay. Oh, let me let, let me start the that first paragraph over again. Never forget the world the sightless quote see end quote must be imagined for what it really looks like is unknown to them. They must infer what could be seen from evidence forever indirect, there's the indirect word, and reconstruct their inferences as they stumble and fall because of what they did not recognize or walk unharmed through open doorways that they thought were closed. And so it is with you. You do not see, and here's the line that I, just, I think is really brilliant. Your cues for inference are wrong. And so you stumble and fall down upon the stones you did not recognize but fail to be aware you can go through doors you thought were closed, but which stand open before unseeing eyes waiting to welcome you. So the direct path is always there. <laughs> Just, you know, the door's open, we, we don't see it. So we have to, we have to indirectly um, undo with Holy Spirit's help all the barriers and eventually, you know, remove the blinders, right? So. Can you uh, give me an example or give us an example of a cue for inference? Like well, what the I, hell is it? What is inference anyway? Well, I, well you kind of, you, <laughs> if, you're, if you're blindfolded, you know, you, you, you might, if, if I was walking around my house, I might, you know, put my hand on, you know, or, or my foot against the, uh, a sofa or a chair or, or a, a countertop or something. And I might say, oh, well, that, I know what that is. And so this, this, this must be that because it feels like this. You know, if I was doing a blind walk, if you've ever done that with anyone, you know, you kind of walk around, you say, okay, well, now what, what, what am I looking at now, you know, but, uh, but we just make assumptions based on our past misperceptions about everything. And uh, because we, we think that we pulled off the impossible. <laughs> so all of our cues for inference are wrong, even, even, the, even the, uh, the physical ones, you know, but uh, Anyway, so um, yeah, I, I just I just think that's such an important idea that that you know we have such limited awareness, or so we don't have no basis for judgment. You know, it's it's from the course's perspective, we can't even judge. It's impossible because the way the course defines judgment, you know, the real real judgment, you know, we we don't have the equipment for it as separate selves. Right? David uh, David Delaplane was telling a story about his wife. Um, so, you know, David and, and his wife are up there in age. <laughs> so, and his wife put on one of those virtual reality things. Uh -huh. And she, you know, she's seeing things that aren't there. And she's moving around them as she's walking through the room. Like mm -hmm. she's seeing a table that's not there. But that's what we're all doing. Those are all cues for, 
I need to walk around this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a like perfect that. example. Perfect example. Yeah, virtual. Is we're all in a virtual reality holographic movie of our own projections, and we forgot that we <laughs> were part of the programming team that made this elaborate ruse, and uh, you know, and we 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 thought we uh, erased our names from the source code files, and and so now we can claim that it's being done to us. You know, in which the victimhood martyrdom scenario kicks in with that. <laughs> but then, if we look carefully, it's like, oh no, I, I, I was one of the authors of the software. <laughs> Oops, can't use that excuse anymore for being upset with the world. Okay. So another another instance of the the other two that aren't in chapter fourteen. Uh, the other one is um, chapter one, section two. And this is talking about revelations, which I think really ties in beautifully to the topic of, you know, can God be re reached directly? And it is, um, and I'll, it's another short paragraph, which I'll just read, but uh, if you want it, the reference for, for, for future, future lookup, it's um, chapter one, section two, paragraph five, and I'm going to read the first five sentences. Revelations are indirectly inspired by me because I am close to the Holy Spirit and alert to the revelation readiness of my brothers. I can thus bring down to them more than they can draw down to themselves. The Holy Spirit mediates higher to lower communication, keeping the direct channel from God to you open for revelation. Revelation is not reciprocal. It proceeds from God to you, but not from you to God. That seem, the last part seems pretty obvious. <laughs> and, and if I had a revelation to share with God, it probably wouldn't be that, that interesting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that the whole idea that, you know, Holy Spirit helps us, it kind of keeps the foot in the door so that, you know, we, we can walk through it uh, and not uh, use the excuse that it's locked, which kind of ties in to what you were saying earlier, Tim. It's like, you know, we... We can, uh, if we're careful and, and observant, we can notice that the Holy Spirit is always encouraging us to do what we can in every moment to, um, you know, practice forgiveness and be mindful and, and you know, look with forgiving eyes and see that nothing happened. I, I had to smile. At it. I'm always trying to share my revelations with God. He doesn't seem to know what's going on here. Let, let me tell you, God, what you need to focus on. <laughs> I, I got some serious revelations that you're just missing the boat on here. <laughs> yeah. And of course, if we're honest with ourselves, we do that all the time, right? <laughs> we're, whether, whether we speak it out loud to the people that are around us or that we're in communication with or not, it, it's sort of the implied, well, I've got, I've got things figured out and, and, and my view of the world is is so important, <laughs> but well, maybe not. So anyway, so the other four instances of the word indirect are in um, chapter fourteen, uh, section one, and um, it's in page two two seventy in the text. So I thought that would be worth reading because there's a lot of good stuff in that section. Um, it's the conditions of learning. So, uh, could I get some volunteers to read? Who would who would like to read the first paragraph? Again, that's page two seventy in the text. It's the first uh, first section after the introduction in chapter fourteen. Okay, Vicky. Thanks. All right, the conditions of learning. If you are blessed and do not know it, you need to learn it must be so. The knowledge is not taught, but its conditions must be acquired, for it is they that have been thrown away. You can learn to bless and cannot give what you have not. If then you offer blessing, it must have come first to yourself, and you must also have accepted it as yours. For how else could you give it away? That is why miracles offer you the testimony that you are blessed. If what you offer is complete forgiveness, you must have let guilt go, accepting the atonement for yourself and learning you are guiltless. How could you learn what has been done for you, un unknown to you, unless you do what you would have to do if it had been done for you? 
Wow. Do you think that's fake it till you make it like an AA? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that works, why not? But uh... <laughs> exactly. At least yeah. have the illusion that you're blessed if you can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, it would be actually maybe the, the course is not no curriculum would be challenge, you know, be willing to challenge the assumption that the ego would offer that you're not blessed. You know, challenge the condemning assumption. <laughs> Maybe that's another way of stating it. If that's the if that's the indirect approach, right? Right. Yeah. And and I think I think forgiveness is is uh, I mean basically magical. It's a it's an illusion to forgive illusions, and um, but when you do it, you get that sense of peace mm -hmm. and. Um, in unforgiveness, you're just picking apart everybody and everything. You don't see yourself as blessed. So that un that forgiveness brings happiness and peace is uh, absolutely true. And uh, so just do it like a Nike commercial. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, did anyone else stop at sentence two where it says uh, the knowledge is not taught but its conditions must have been acquired for it is they that have been thrown away anybody stop thinking what the conditions might be it occurred, occurred to me it's like well what does the course seem to emphasize well inner peace you know perfect inner peace <laughs> so if that's if that's the the uh the the uh the secret code that's in the card that you slide at the in the uh the card reader or maybe the the uh password you give to the, the bouncer for the backstage pass for the <laughs> for the party um if peace is is the condition then uh we have to figure well how do i get the peace well i get the peace by forgiving so so there's the indirect thing i have to i have to indirectly get to the peace by learning to forgive what didn't happen so yeah yeah i never quite i never quite thought of it that way but the, the conditions for an experience of knowledge, of oneness, of non-duality. It's I, I have to do all the not knows. Like I, I'm willing to lay down my judgments. I'm willing to uh, lay down all kinds of stuff <laughs> that I'm invested in. That's not that aren't working. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a whole lot of not knows, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. So I, I mean that that whole. That whole I like that like the for example in that paragraph too in that uh, in lesson ninety five um, or ninety four so one of the conditions could be true light an experience of what real light is not not this light but mm -hmm. what what inner light is an experience of what real strength is and what a, what an experience of sinlessness is even the word sinless is basically a not no yeah it's like yeah. I'm not sinful right what if that's true. I start with you. What if you're not sinful? <laughs> like uh, that's what I'm willing to offer you the possibility of that first, and then, and then see what that happens. And then I feel good, like Vicky was saying. I offer you the, even though you're, you're a total jerk and you're doing terrible things to the planet, etc. I offer you the possibility that maybe innately, in, internally, you're still sinless. And then I feel better. Okay, I'll try it again. But even that's a not no. Maybe you're not s sinful. Yeah. If if the original no was the belief in separation, then anything that returns our identity to wholeness by seeing that our identity includes in our innocence the innocence of every, you know just one other one other alleged other, we you know start aggregating all those innocent selves, <laughs> seemingly one at a time or two at a time I guess, two by two and entering the arc. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyone else for the next paragraph? I'd like to read. Yeah, Bruce, I'll take it. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks. That's that's two, right? Uh huh. Indirect proof of truth is needed in a world made of denial and without direction. You will perceive the need for this if you realize that to deny is the decision not to know. The logic of the world must therefore lead to nothing, for its goal is nothing. 
If you decide to have and give and be nothing except a dream, you must direct your thoughts into unto oblivion. And if you have, if you have and give and are everything, and all this has been denied, your thought system is closed off and wholly separated from the truth. This is an insane world and do not underestimate the extent of its insanity. There is no area of your perception that it has not touched and your dream is sacred to you. That is why God placed the Holy Spirit in you where you place the dream. Thoughts on that, Joe? Um, yeah, you know, I think originally it's like the, the this uh, couple of lessons ago, I think it was that it talked about, you know, that God, God placed the fix right where the problem was, you know, like right in the crux of the problem. So, yeah, um, and, uh, and that's, that's obviously very merciful, you know, that we don't have to <laughs> clamor around for that. Yeah, yeah. Really, really. Don't yeah. have to book a flight to Madagascar or anything. Huh? Right. Just right. To... <laughs> Yep. And then I think what comes to mind with that whole thing is um, uh, God did not create a meaningless world. So the world we see is meaningless for sure, but God did not create that. <laughs> what a relief, huh? Yeah. Now we just got to figure out how, how to uh, reach God. <laughs> mm. Yeah, exactly. I, there's several sentences in that that really grab me as, uh, you know, the, one is, um, well, it, it, the indirect proof is what's needed. Again, that's that's because we made, well, right, right off the bat, it says that we, in a world made of denial and without direction. Well, the direction, the only direction that makes sense is back to the place in the mind and the decision maker to... <laughs> open that secret compartment to that ego says you know hands off danger danger and and throw the switch over to the holy spirit position from the ego position and uh <laughs> so th that's the only direction that that the course asks us to consider and the ego denies and that, and, and the uh, the other one is this is an insane world do not underestimate the extent of its insanity i i think i think i probably underestimate on a fairly frequent basis throughout the day <laughs> if i'm honest with myself because i still think well if i just you know check enough things off my to-do list today or if i just you know if there's if there's just enough things that go right you know i can still be peaceful in the world and and still think i'm in it and think that it's going to work out okay and there's nothing wrong with that it's just like but there's this sort of nag you think well that's never really going to work is it <laughs> when you reflect back, it's like the only thing that really has ever worked is um, following that inner kindness teacher's um, promptings, you know, looking, looking for those uh, suggestions in our mind and, and, and following up on those ideas. Yeah. So anyway, any other thoughts on that Sally? Sally had some. Oh, Sally? I'm okay. I found out where you were just by, by going onto the um, ACIM website. So Okay, great, great. I'm, hey, Bruce. I'm, I'm, I'm with you now. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Ali. Bruce, Jim? Yeah. just one thought I had is, uh, you know, the, the, the pattern of the last couple of days of lessons where, uh, you know, on the hour you think of the lesson, you know, and then it's like, what kind of trouble could, you know, like, okay, well, now that I'm done with that, now I have to do this, you know, it's like uh. the, the, the brain gets back engaged. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone not experience that? <laughs> but I, th I think the important thing to do is to notice the contrast. And the more we notice the contrast between when we let go of the ego's, you know, hammering <laughs> and just give ourselves a few moments of rest, but, you know, we're actually eager to try it a, a little more frequently, you know? Just say, oh, that, that's actually kind of nice. You know, I, I, I could I could do more of that. Yeah. When I was trying to uh, figure out a, a title for the closing um, 
closing whatever gathering at the retreat, you know, something powerful, you know, the word. And Lynn, Lynn's going to do it, so I was trying to think of something. And, and, and I just came up with this word. It's actually in line five. If you have everything, and you give everything, and you are everything. So I, I just put Lynn on everything, because you never know what Lynn's going to do anyway. So, <laughs> so, but she, you know, it's all, it's all included in that package. Lynn on everything. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're muted, Lynn. Did you want to say something? No? Okay, okay. Well, you are have and do and in everything and give everything as we all do, right? <laughs> yeah, and we're just not aware of it yet. So, but we're getting there. The other the other line the, the other phrase that uh, jumped out at me is your dream is sacred to you. Well, okay, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and that's in that paragraph. Okay, any, anyone for paragraph three? Uh, Jean, thanks. Uh, Bruce, real quick, could you oh, oh, back. could you just say the page number where you are? Oh, you betcha, you betcha. It is uh, page two seventy. Thank you. Yep, thanks. It's the first paragraph graph in chapter fourteen, or the first first section, paragraph three. Yep. Seeing is always outward. Were your thoughts wholly of you? The thought system you made would be forever dark. The thoughts the mind of God's son projects or extends have all the power that he gives to them. The thoughts he shares with God are beyond his belief, but those he made are his beliefs. And it is these and not the truth that he has chosen to defend and love. They will not be taken from him, but they can be given up by him for the source of their undoing is in him. There is nothing in the world to teach him that the logic of the world is totally insane and leads to nothing. Yet in him who made this insane logic, there is one who knows it leads to nothing for he knows everything. Musings on that, Jane? Well, you know, I think that the reason I wanted to read was I stumbled upon <clears throat> uh, sentence four, and I stumbled on it. The thoughts he shares with God are beyond his belief, but those he made are his beliefs. And it's like I stumbled on it. And, and I realized because that's so powerful, you know, and as we talk about this and how you're going in the indirect ways, I see how we have a really hard time. We would have a really hard time directly we really, because we don't, I mean, I didn't even want to sit with that statement. As I was reading it, I, I had trouble with it. And I was thinking how, you know, the indirectness does help us find our way there. And, and you know, it's funny because as we study more, I have found myself like the word direct. I'm finding myself in life more direct in, in the physical world, in the ego world or whatever, in ways that are freeing me. And, I, and so there is something to, to knowing that that's bigger than me mm. in however I have communication. I don't know how to express it, but it's freed me in certain ways. And, and there's, as we read about the kindness that we talk about, is there too in my directness. So this is, I just really appreciate this tonight because I really needed it tonight. <laughs> Thank you. You too. <laughs> I, I think we're all in the same boat, as they say. Right? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The, the um, well, there were several parts of it, but as usual. But uh, what is the, the, let's see. Oh, yeah. Per, per, sentence eight. There is nothing in the world to teach him that the logic of the world is totally insane and leads to nothing. Wow. Yeah. You know, and, and it ties into what what you were just talking about. The you know the two two different kinds of you know beyond belief which is really where our real identity is beyond space, beyond time, beyond limitation of any kind, uh, and certainly beyond e any ego beliefs. But then the beliefs that we made up are what we're, we still value and we still need to question every value and every belief that we have in order to be free, right? But um, yeah, nothing in the world to teach. I was just thinking the ego is sort of like uh, this, this sinister Machiavellian uh, voice says, ah, yes. The propaganda coverage is complete. <laughs> no one will suspect there's a, a better way. <laughs> but, 
but <laughs> at the same time, you know, of course, says, well, it may be foolproof, but it's not godproof. So fortunately, we, we, we've all kind of gotten a glimpse of the, that it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a way out of it. And that's where Holy Spirit comes in. Yeah, thanks. How about number paragraph four? It's a, a, well, it's an interesting play on the word belief. Like, like whatever I think I believe is probably not true. So, and the two big beliefs from Jesus' point of view that he's trying to undo in me is I believe I'm upset for the reason I think. Mm -hmm. I know I'm upset for the reason I think. It's not just I believe it, I know it in my gut. <laughs> I know I'm upset for the reason I think. And then the second is I know how to find peace. <laughs> you know, it's like lesson 34. Like, like I, I know what needs to be done in you and me for us to find peace. Which means peace isn't there, and and now I know how to get back to it. So if the the underlying belief is peace isn't there. I believe peace isn't there. Mm -hmm. I believe there's not this. We don't share this identity as God's son. I could see that if I asked for help. Lesson thirty four. I could see peace instead of this. I could I could experience my true identity as God's son, but I don't I don't want to. I don't I don't want to believe. You know, it's almost like. It's like the beliefs are, 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 are like, I don't want to believe I'm, ups you know, like, uh, um, um, like even the possibility that maybe I'm not upset for the reason I think is just so challenging to everything I think I see and do and take for granted. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty staggering, isn't it? How, how often we, you know, still think that we're upset for the reason we think. And like you say, no. And, uh, yeah, and then in uh, <laughs> 34, you know, maybe the original version was, um, I could see peace instead of this guilt cesspool, but uh, they left off the other two words, right? <laughs> so, okay, now we've got another paragraph that talks about, that uses two, two instances of the word indirect. So who'd, who'd like to read paragraph four? Yeah. Scanning the horizon for volunteers. Rebecca, thank you. I don't know where we are. Uh, chapter, sec, uh, paragraph four. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Any direction that would lead you where the Holy Spirit leads you not goes nowhere. Anything you deny that he knows to be true, you have denied yourself. And he must therefore teach you not to deny it. Undoing is indirect as doing is. You were created only to create, neither to see or nor do. These are but indirect expressions of the will to live, which has been blocked by the capricious and unholy whim of death and murder that your father does not share with you. You have set yourself the task of sharing what cannot be shared. And while you think it possible to learn to do this, you will not believe all that is possible to learn to do. <laughs> got to really focus on that one <laughs> yeah what, what what comes to mind on that one for you Rebecca um you know I got an image of myself or anyone really just like squeezing their fists and crunch you know getting all crouched up and like I'm doing something I'm doing something <laughs> and you're doing nothing I mean it's it's really he's really saying everything you think you do you don't and you don't even know what your function really is. You know, this whole idea of this entire system we've created that we call the world where we shuffle. I, I, I was telling a friend today that what I've realized my dreams are just me shuffling things back and forth. Like I'm trying to solve problems that don't exist and I don't really know where I am, but I know that something's not right and I gotta fix it. And that's just the way my waking life is too, when I'm, not, when I'm in ego mode. Um, but this, when I can, when I can 
when I can reach the place where I remember that it's not real, <laughs> then I'm so relieved because we're just working so hard at doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> well said. I know I am. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we're all in the same boat and uh, yeah. Which, which reminds me of another favorite mixed metaphor is that we're, we're all rearranging holodeck chairs on a Titanic dream, so. Yeah, and that line, <laughs> the line three, undoing is indirect as doing is. I yep. mean, yep. that is, I, I don't think I understood that for so long, like, it's all indirect. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's just really powerful. Exactly. Thank you. Rem removing the barriers is indirect. So to the awareness of love's presence, it's not like, oh, I, I don't, I don't have to affirm love. I just have to deny the denial of love, which is intrinsically indirect. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So how, how is doing indirect? Doing would have to be indirect because we are um, doing or undoing really is, is still working on the level of form, right? So I'm trying to have peace, but the way I'm doing it is kind of it's taking me down a road that doesn't allow me to have it right like that like that maybe i don't know i, I would think yeah yeah but but i like i like how the course says you know that forgiveness is an illusion which i think would be indirect but it it's it's the one illusion that undoes all the other illusions that's that to me is the ah that's <laughs> i can get with that illusion <laughs> no and it, I, and it's I gonna help yeah. I just realized in the first sentence, any direction that would lead you where the Holy Spirit leads you not goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. So then when you take that, doing can't have a direction because it goes nowhere because it's our illusion of doing. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for pointing that out because I, I was noticing that too is the, the word direct appears in this, uh, is this section as well. And it's kind of like, you know, we keep, we keep pointing, <laughs> you know, horizontally that oh here's here's all the things on the, the wheel of misfortune or the the uh, unmerry go round of of our dreams of all the specific things that that become our targets for projected grievances and so the doing usually involves you know some kind of horizontal battle of some sort um and the holy spirit says well the only direction <laughs> as, as plato's finger in a classic uh, artwork suggests is is the, the vertical of going back into the mind, choosing the decision maker and saying, oh, if I direct my thoughts toward, you know, that place in the mind where I can forgive, then I can get some real traction. Then I'm not in an idle mind state. Yeah. And, and how would you define capricious? Like, is that like unpredictable or? or... I'd have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm going to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> it says, given to sudden and unaccountable changes of mood or behavior. Fickle, inconstant, changeable, variable, unstable, mercurial, volatile, erratic, vacillating, irregular, inconsistent, fitful, arbitrary, impulsive, and more. <laughs> that, that pretty much says anything that's, everything that's not eternal. So a capricious sounds pretty egoic to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he just adds unholy for the people who don't have a dictionary handy, I think. Yeah. Blocked by the capricious and unholy whim of death and murder that your father does not share with you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yowza. A lot in that paragraph. Thanks, Rebecca. Any volunteers for the fifth paragraph? Gene, Gene had something. Okay, Gene. You know, I was just thinking, Bruce, earlier you talked about how Revelation goes one way and, and look at the ways we stall at receiving the gift. Yeah. I mean, look at this. Think about that. It goes one way. Like when you, when you read that and I thought about that, like, could I just receive? Oh no, I'm going to do all this. <laughs> exactly. I, I've got to prepare a, 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 a state a, a, you know, very well, uh, planned statement of to tell God, you know, what needs to be done, right? So <laughs> rather than just listen, yeah, exactly. Who'd like to read paragraph five? Chris, thanks.
I did a pre-read to see if I wanted to read it or not. After, <laughs> after the first sentence that I have, that sounds like it's for me. Okay, all right. You guys listen along if you want. The Holy Spirit, therefore, must begin his teaching by showing you what you can never learn. His message is not indirect, but he must introduce the simple truth into a thought system which has become so twisted and weird and so complex, you cannot see that it means nothing. It merely looks at its foundation and dismisses it. I'm sorry. Oh, there's a good mess. <laughs> That's why sometimes I read, the, I read this and it's like, what? Yeah, but that time, that time it was uh, the wrong word. He merely looks at its foundation and dismisses it. But you, who cannot undo what you have made, nor escape the heavy burden of its dullness that lies upon your mind, cannot see through it. It deceives you because you choose to deceive yourself. Those who choose to be deceived will merely attack direct approaches because they seem to encroach upon decept deception and strike at it. I think I'll read that last one one more time. Those who choose to be deceived will merely attack direct approaches. Okay, so if I'm choose, I want to be deceived and somebody says, no, that's not the way it is, especially if Jesus says that, those who choose to be deceived will merely attack direct approaches. So there's no sense in being direct, I think, because they seem to encroach upon deception and strike at it because I'm wanting to be deceived. So sometimes I do uh, run into people, <laughs> other than myself, of course, that, that are, are bent on uh, arguing or, or, oh, they're such good debaters, you know, they can take the opposite side. And you, we just don't want to, I think it kind of reminds me of the authority problem. We don't want to uh, listen to the experts, uh, let alone, uh, Holy Spirit or Jesus as an expert, because, uh, oh, what a fix we've got ourselves in. And it also kind of reminds me of, you know, the person that's gone 20 miles in the wrong direction, which I did recently. And, but I don't want to go back because that's 20 miles back. I'm going to just keep on going, going for who wants to turn around or and part of us like, you know, I don't want to admit that I made a mistake. But you're going for the all roads like, lead to Rome approach, right? Yeah, so eventually yeah. the road you're, you're on will get you where you're going. I will get there. The ocean away. <laughs> Even if it's a cul-de-sac, right? You're going to be just yeah. a boonie crashing. <laughs> but it, it just seems to describe so well, really, the fix uh, we, we've put ourselves in. We're so attached to this thinking. Um, and, and certainly our, uh, our culture um reinforces this that intellect is so very important uh especially growing up i think too it's it's like why, why would we give that up and uh i don't know i had somebody came to a unity our unity church recently a really good singer and he was kind of a coarse person and his son was asking him these, this question it seemed real simple answer but he said i'm going to answer it the way i always answered is what people say the, the current thinking is this but that doesn't mean it's true and then you go on to say this is maybe maybe you know why the sky is blue uh or whatever the the question might have been so that's just a power packed uh, paragraph and it's it's uh, comforting too to know uh that that we've done this to ourselves, and it's it feels very heavy that we've done all this, the twisted, I think I even added uh, in weird. I, I appreciated that in addition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> twisted uh, fix you. This is another fine fix you've got me in, Ollie. And uh, it just got, uh, yeah, okay, that is, that, that, feels, that feels true. So I don't have to, uh, I don't have to add on being a, being a doofus for, for getting myself in this spot. Because that, certainly doesn't work no we're, that, that's we're, we're all tough on ourselves enough as it is yeah right? so, yeah yeah. <laughs> so. yeah great
Mm -hmm. well, thanks for your story about the extra 20 miles, too. I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> And that's an understatement. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole coming into the row is an extra. <laughs> exactly. 20,015 miles. <laughs> we're, we're all on Gilligan's Island, which was supposed to be a three hour tour, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The so other, I, am uh, coming, I am coming to the retreat, but if I don't get there till Monday, you'll know why. <laughs> 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 a wave on the road is rough. just another 20 miles and you'll be there right? first of all when i got to denver i was thinking i was gonna go north for an hour and a half <laughs> someplace i got an email that said when you head south it's like why would i head south that was my first thought what? Poor old welcome Tim to fort collins north. maybe i made it <laughs> oh, uh -oh. he doesn't want me to be there oh <laughs> uh -oh. well we, we've all we're all learning to uh, undo our our uh, itinerary to guilt Again's island right so lynn and i were watching uh there's a new documentary on youtube of all places uh, on tick not con it's, it's less than a half hour it's really good hmm. and his life and and you know i was really curious about his approach to taking you to this non-dualistic place and where what does he do and, you know, everybody knows it's mindfulness and he, he was breathing a lot to get to that place of mindfulness. But he didn't start there, which I found pretty wild. Like, talk about indirect approaches. He started with people suffering. And he, he said, you have to really become conscious of how much you're suffering to be almost to be motivated to even go and try out something like meditation. Like, maybe this might help with all your suffering. So, I mean, there was a real... Uh, nuts and bolts kind of indirect approach to not just going right to mindfulness, much less non-duality, but this, this, he starts with, I mean, it, he was in the middle of the, this terrible stuff in Vietnam. The war was raging, you know, everybody was killing each other. We were killing lots of, the, um, no, I mean, it was a mess. The, the Buddhist monks were setting themselves on fire and uh, it was just really, really bad stuff going on. And, and, and in the midst of all that suffering, he developed this whole indirect approach <laughs> to getting to a different place. Mm. It's pretty wild. Mm. Hmm. Maybe you could send the link around it on that. That'd be interesting, yeah. Yeah, very cool. I, I was also thinking about, I think, I think some of Ken Wapnick's commentary talks about how Jesus uses the indirect approach of, of uh, rather than uh, saying, "Hey, you, you might enjoy, you know, re-experiencing perfect oneness." He, he says, you know, basically, "Well, you'll feel better. You'll, <laughs> you won't be in so much pain." Which kind of is really what you were just, uh, you know, talking about. Thich Nhat Hans uh, approach there. Yeah, we have to, we have to acknowledge first that we really are not at peace, uh, and and how the ego has a zero batting record uh, in order to. Be willing to consider choosing against it. Yeah. Okay. Lynn, Lynn Ulm. Okay. Then? Uh, yeah, one of the things that I found about that paragraph five is he really talks about how um, we can't undo the thought system because we made it. Mm -hmm. It's really clear. I mean, I don't know how many times I have spent over the years of study, just feeling terrible that I can't get this. You know, it's logically, I understand the ego's insane, it's making me unhappy, I'm miserable, and I don't change. <clears throat> and so, you know, and even where he, he talks about how um, if there's a, if the Holy Spirit and Jesus were to attack our belief system directly, we would attack back. Mm -hmm. And which is what we do. That's what all our, um, our grievances are all about. That's how we normally function in the world. So, I mean, I think he's really laying it down that this is what we're up against. And, and that's what he, he's starting with us right there. It's like, we don't have to get to some other place in order for him to teach us. Right. He can teach us right here. Yep. Believing 
as deeply and insistently on the ego as we do. He can start right here. And that, I just, um, I just find that so encouraging. I had so much time, the twisted logic. And you know, I was sitting this afternoon and I was sort of weeping because it's like the ego is insane and I am insane when I'm choosing it. And I'm trying to find sanity while I'm choosing it. I mean, it's just, just sort of sitting there with that and going, oh yeah, I really have to know that. As long as I think there's, it's like what you were talking about, Bruce, earlier. As long as I think there's a possibility of making sense of insanity, that's the route I'm going to choose. So the indirect learning is really, <laughs> talk about indirect, showing me how what I'm thinking and what I'm uh, imagining and making real is actually making me unhappy. I haven't, that's the connection that has to happen before there's a willingness to try something that's pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. I love yeah. that paragraph. That's really thank you. That's really helpful. And and yeah, we have to we have to really see the depth and breadth. And you know, like one of the things we read a few moments ago, that it, everything in this world really is as out of the shoot by default as as an ego <laughs> production. <laughs> insane it's just it's you know 100 percent insane and until we you know I, I, our own sweet time and our own you know good you know our own good time <laughs> come to that conclusion um you know of our own free will and accord at that point then it's like oh well okay if once once i've seen that there's really nothing left i'm, I'm kind of reminded of that scene in in uh, the first star wars movie where luke skywalker goes back to where his aunt and uncle had raised him and that little village is kind of wiped out and you realize well there's nothing nothing left for me here <laughs> maybe i could try i mean we don't have to get to that point of devastation but we have to see that the ego's thought system is that level of devastation uh and not not uh you know condemn it just just see that it's not real i think we need holy spirit's help to see that it's not real that there that there is a real alternative that there is a better way yeah, and then it's like then there's then there there's then there's a light at the end of the tunnel that <laughs> that's always been there. Yeah. Okay. How about if we now go to the actual uh, theme du jour? Uh, this is uh, section twenty six in the manual. Can God be reached directly? Which is anyone have the page number handy? I can look it up real quick. Uh, manual page sixty. 64 thank you that's right okay anyone like to read the first paragraph who hasn't read them i'd like to read any volunteers reese thanks okay can god be reached directly <clears throat> god indeed can be reached directly for there is no distance between him and his son. His awareness is in everyone's memory and his word is written on everyone's heart. <coughs> Yet this awareness, <coughs> this memory can arise across the threshold of recognition only where all barriers to truth have been removed. In how many is this the case? Here then is the role of God's teachers. They too have not attained the necessary understanding as yet, but they have joined with others. This is what sets them apart from the world, and it is this that enables others to leave the world with them. Alone they are nothing, but in their joining is the power of God. And uh, I've been thinking you know, they can't be read, God can be reached directly. And really the only place to reach him is in the present moment, you know, in the atonement. And that's why, I mean, there's nothing to do. And uh, it's just, and with all of us in this group that I've learned through studying this, it, it's, it's uh, alone, I can't do it, but in joining with, with all of the students in this group, 
or other people. I, I, I can feel it once in a while. And uh, when it happens, you know, it's, it's a moment, a holy instant, just a really quick feeling of being reached, you know, really not reaching, but being reached, being able to be still enough and not do anything like Javier, you shared with us the last class where you, when you gave up searching for a sign, that was when it happened, you know, so it's like, that's so opposite, you know, it's very indirect to give up <laughs> and to say, okay, I give up. And, and in those very tiny instances when I give up and realize that's where, you know, I'm asking for help or just allow it, almost without expecting it, that's when it happens. Thank you. Yeah. Just when we let go, sometimes that's <laughs> just release the, the clenched fist or the, the uh, you know white knuckled grip on <laughs> the steering wheel of our mind, so to speak. It's like, that's when it's like, oh, it gets, gets easier. Yeah. The, image I, the image I had, it was like, you know, we put our hands up. I mean, this goes back to the introduction to A Course in Miracles. This is not a course about love. This is not a course about a direct approach. Mm -hmm. This is a course about laying down the blocks. What do you say in line three? All, where all the barriers to truth have been removed. Well, I'm the one that put them up. And then I'm sitting, standing here behind the barriers going, Jesus, help me. But I, I don't want to put the barriers down. <laughs> I, want, I want to have a direct experience of God. I can't do it. You know, I'm trying to peek through my fingers. <laughs> I mean, I'm the one putting up the blocks. Yeah, and it's, I'm not, the, yeah. it's not even the fact that you put them up. It's, we're holding them. And so when we let go, literally, we go, okay, I'm not going to hold these blocks in front. Then letting go is not putting any effort anymore, you know. I like, I like the holding the, the hands over the face. That's a great metaphor. The other, the other visual that comes to mind is if anybody's seen that scene in Blazing Saddles where Slim Pickens and his band of mean hombres comes in to ransack the town and and uh, the, the governor puts up a, a toll crossing out in the middle of the desert. You know, they, they go go around it miles in either direction. But but he and his you know dozen horsemen come up to this thing. The, the, the gate stops down and and you know toll ten cents and and he says, "Damn, now we got to go back and get us a whole shitload of dimes." <laughs> I was like that, that line. I think Chris Jansen was the guy they sent back. <laughs> <laughs> he says yeah he's used to going extra the extra mile the extra 20 miles even right so, exactly but but to me it's like you know we're, we're the we're the mel brooks you know that made the movie that made the, the 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 toll crossing in our mind you know that says no i can't go there i i can't you know there's no holy spirit i, I keep there's so there's nobody to tell me i could go around you know 100 miles in either direction around the silly imaginary toll gate but uh, but that's what we do, you know. That I think that's where the, you know, some of those silly things get our attention. It's like, well, yeah, I'm actually I, the secret of salvation is this. I'm doing it to myself. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, how about paragraph two? Any volunteers for that one? Jerry, thanks. There are those who have reached God directly, retaining no trace of worldly limits and remembering their own identity perfectly. These might be called the teachers of teachers because although they are no longer visible, their image can yet be called upon. And they will appear when and where it is helpful for them to do so. To those to whom such appearances would be frightening, they give their ideas. No one can call on them in vain, nor is there anyone of whom they are unaware. All needs are known to them and all mistakes are recognized and overlooked by them. The time will come when this is understood. And meanwhile, they give all their gifts to the teachers of God who look to them for help 
asking all things in their name and in no other. Well, I guess it gives each one of us something to shoot for. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I think of the Indian mystics uh, and how oftentimes they kind of come to mind, at least for me, in terms of the reading. Yeah. Um, uh, and I notice myself calling on them um, for vision or for understanding or uh, it's just kind of a reassuring sort of piece. You're thinking like Nisargadatta, Ramana Maharshi, those kind of yeah. folks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Well, Jesus is probably a pretty good candidate too, I think. And Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I think I think Stephen had some thoughts on this paragraph too, right, Stephen? Before before the class started, you, you said you're pondering this paragraph a bit. Um this this uh I guess this is probably my favorite paragraph in the whole course. Yeah. Because the first time I ever read it, I said, okay, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> and and uh, also, it's it's like uh, it reminds me of holy companions. It reminds me of mighty companions. Uh, it it also reminds me that uh, you know when when I have a loved one that leaves, it's easier for me to talk to them. You know, uh, I uh, I have a whole group of of uh, teachers of teachers uh, that I have in my life, and almost daily, you know, I'll talk to like ten of them or four of them, and. Uh, you know, I always wondered what that was. And this gives me an idea that my wondering was okay. Because what this is saying to me, if I read it, if I read it for what it actually says is, there's some in-betweeners. There's some, some wonderments uh, that we always hoped was there. Uh, but, and this is kind of saying it is. I don't want to go too far for, with this because, you, you know, um, uh, listening to Wapnick, he doesn't go too far with this kind of stuff. Uh, I listened to what he said about this paragraph, and it, it was it was really kind of short, and uh, and and very conservative. Uh, and so uh, I'll keep it I'll keep it like that as best I can. But this paragraph uh, lets me know that be otherworldly. It's okay to think like that because there's something in between here. There there's some, you know, they're 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 not uh, they don't they no longer have a, a body. Uh, they, they're someone we can talk to. Uh, they're perfect in every way. They, you know, they're never going to make us scared. And, and there is no they. But you know, when, I, when I put this with level one and the oneness, I get really confused really quickly because I don't, I don't know why would there be in-betweeners when, when you put this with everything else that the Course says. I'm so glad you, uh, you, you asked me about this. I've never talked to about it's uh, you know so upfront and honestly with myself much less with uh 22 other people thanks for asking sure you betcha you, I, I figured you had something to offer because you mentioned it <laughs> thanks thanks and 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 we all um you know we're, we're all that one self huh even even though we have symbols that seem to represent that uh and it seems like that's the ongoing process is is recognizing that all the the characteristics that we admire and and uh you know are inspired by uh their extensions of what we really are i think that's part of you know the indirect <laughs> process of, of removing the blo blocks or to the, the idea that well maybe that really is in my mind and, and never left yeah thanks the kinship we all share yeah. Yeah. this was one of the only two pages in my whole course book that i did not mark and and as I was reading it today, I was wondering why. Just and and I don't like it. I mean, I don't know about Jerry, but that first sentence in paragraph two is like, there are those who reached God directly, nah nah nah. But it wasn't you. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> so I was wondering if Jerry had that reaction too, like I had, but I'm not sure. Jerry, did you have that reaction? Mm. Oh, you're on, you're on mute. <laughs> you don't want to tell us. You're on mute, Chair. Oh, there you go. 
No, I, I, uh, and I now you're not. muffled. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you know, I didn't think about myself in that whole process. I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel left out. Somehow I felt kind of included in that whole process. It's kind of a reassuring sentence. <clears throat> Let me read it again. There are those who have reached God directly, returning no trace of worldly limits and remembering their own identity perfectly. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with it. Yeah, the, the, the word that jumps out at me in that last, the last part of that sentence is capital I identity. If it had been lowercase identity, then it would have been perplexing. But but it capitalized like okay we're all in that we, everybody's got a place on that that uh, that flight <laughs> it's a it's one big jet <laughs> yeah thanks Chris Chris Jansen is Chris I had uh, the thought that um, I have to tell it later okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh. All good. <laughs> well, well, I'll be uh -oh. eagerly anticipating when we hear it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try again. It's still wrong. But I think Jesus could be talking about children here because he's talked about, you know, let the little children come to me. And I don't think it's. Um... Sorry. We lost a four year old this week. Oh. But I think. Uh... He's in a good place, but to me, his, uh, I just think he's, he's innocent. And when I let it go, I know Liam's okay, but he's speaking to me, to all of us, uh, especially at my uh, church. Tragic accident on one hand and on the other, it's such a good example to me. of uh, let the little children come to me. I think that those may be the uh, teachers of God because they're innocent. And I also think that um, when we get through the grieving, um, everybody want to be more like that, you know, just innocent of what we say and how we feel. And uh, there's also such room for judgment because the way he died, I think people are asking, how could his mother let him be in that situation? He either drowned or was uh, exposed to the elements. It was a very cold day and they were kayaking. And, you know, some people we've talked about it and it's like, how could you do that? And how, I, don't, we don't, I don't know how it happened. I mean, the mother didn't try to kill him and she, uh, almost died herself and uh, they just couldn't get to him in time. But I, I really feel like um, little people like that, it's so hard to deal with at a young age, but I think they're teachers of God. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, with, uh, with, with vision, I think we can see everyone as a, as a teacher of God, can't we? And, uh, Certainly some, some situations, it's pretty obvious. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I think Jean has something. Jean? Oh, no. Okay. No? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Chris. That, that, yeah, I think, I think we, we'd get where you're, <laughs> what, what you're sharing. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Sometimes that those incidents kind of open up the channels, don't they, to, to that more direct experience? Yeah, of the, the innocence that really is behind everyone. And uh, we can just yeah, see it's it. something that's kind of un, you can't really understand it. We're talking about how understanding, and we think we can understand it. You, you can't really understand it, but mm -hmm. I think it's when we can just let go of our beliefs that that's uh, even a bad thing. I mean, this kid is happy yeah. now. And he always, but he always was. He, it was just like, 
uh, this is, you know, like a little four-year-old and uh, he's in a congregation of old people that are just sitting around, you know, uh, I've, I've kind of putting ourselves down a little bit, but he just brought so much life to everybody. And I think, uh, I think when it talked about, when you just think about these people, even though they're not visible, how, the, how uplifting they can be. And uh, that just seems so true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking earlier today, this week about, um, you know, we got teachers of God, all of us, and then we got advanced teachers, Muji, John Butler, Ken, and then we got, you know, the teacher of teachers, the ones that are uh, beyond s seeming form. And, and all of them, I mean, all of them, the, the prime directive, if you will, for all of them is to turn around and share what they know with everybody else. I mean, it's not like I got it and you don't. I mean, I mean, as soon as they get it, it's like their whole, whole, everything becomes, I need to share this with everybody. Muji shares it with everybody. John Butler shares it with everybody. Ken shared it with everybody. We at our best share it with everybody. So, there, I mean, there's not a monopoly on this stuff. It's not like John Butler has it and I don't. You know what I mean? It's like John Butler turns around and says, come, come on, I'll take you there. <laughs> yeah. Total inclusion, huh? It's uh, complete op openness. Anyone for the next paragraph? Anyone that hasn't read that would like to read or someone who'd like to read again? <laughs> oh, Lynn Altman, Th thanks. I'll go ahead and read. Thanks. Sometimes a teacher of God may have a brief experience of direct union with God. In this world, it is almost impossible that this endure. It can perhaps be won after much devotion and dedication and then be maintained for much of the time on earth. But this is so rare that it cannot be considered a realistic goal. If it happens, so be it. If it does not happen, so be it as well. All worldly states must be illusory. If God were reached directly in sustained awareness, the body would not be long maintained. Those who have laid down the body merely to extend their helpfulness to those remaining behind are few indeed. And they need helpers who are still in bondage and still asleep so that by their awakening can God's voice be heard. Well, that certainly <laughs> leaves room for me. <laughs> for those of us who are uh, trying to uh, open up that that connection and uh, sustain it for more than a fleeting second or two, you know. And uh, I, I must say, though, it's um, it's a little hard to if it happens, so be it. If it does not happen, so be it. That's pretty tough from an ego standpoint to hear. Uh, you know, what do you mean? It doesn't essentially it doesn't matter. That's not what the important thing is. But from the, from the deeper perspective, I'm also really grateful for that reassurance. It means that what I'm doing in my forgiveness practice is what I'm doing, and that's right where I need to be. And, uh, so thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's such an important idea. It kind of ties into with the do not fight yourself. You know, we don't have to struggle. We don't have to, to you know, strive. It's just a matter of allowing and, and you know, letting... You know, the undue curriculum, the, the indirect curriculum is really not about doing, it's about undoing, it's about um, releasing um, our investment in what doesn't work and what we made up that we see, you know, slowly but surely this, <laughs> like, it's just silly. I, I love how Ken Wapnick says, you know, that, that our ego is not evil or sinful or wicked, it's just silly, you know, it's just, it's a forgivable misunderstanding. Yeah, this, this also, the other the piece of that is that the minute we think there's something that we're supposed to do, we've made the error real. 
Yeah. And yeah. So that's really does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're not busy on the level of form. It just means doing on the level of mind, thinking that we have to, to, you know, make our own identity better on our own without Holy Spirit's help. Yeah. So any volunteers for the last paragraph? We could make this a meditation, I suppose. If no one else wants to read it, I'll read it, I guess. Okay. So if you want to just sit back, close your eyes, and uh, let this wash through you here. Do not despair then because of limitations. It is your function to escape from them, but not to be without them. If you would be heard by those who suffer, you must speak their language. If you would be a savior, you must understand what needs to be escaped. Salvation is not theoretical. Behold the problem, ask for the answer, and then accept it when it comes. Nor will its coming be long delayed. All the help you can accept will be provided and not one need you have will not be met. Let us not then be too concerned with the goals for which you are not ready. God takes you where you are and welcomes you. What more could you desire when this is all you need? Okay, thanks everyone. Let's let's uh, see if we can let God reach reach us <laughs> and not not push that love away. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks, Thank Bruce. Bruce. Thanks all. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yay. Bye. All right. See ya. Hmm.